Next up, we have uh, Brett Swartz. So I met Brett um, doing a podcast, and I'll be honest, some, some, sometimes whenever I do a podcast, the, the guests bring items to me that are not the most, most exciting, but this, this was one where um, I had to get it to you all because it was pretty shocking to me in terms of the benefits it could have for people who have some wealth. So I'm going to make you, Brett, host for a minute. There he is. How's it going? <laughs> hey, Tom, how are you? Good. Is that a new, yeah, new office? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's the uh, it's the it's the New York hotel office for the day. I'm on my 12th year anniversary with my wife this week, so we are oh, nice. hanging out in Manhattan. So uh, yeah, oh, so does, live, she live, live live your, does she know that you're spending Does she know that you're spending half an hour of your anniversary with me? <laughs> she does. This is hey, it's, it's a write off, right? We're talking about taxes, right? So we got to get. Oh, I got it. Right? <laughs> Thirty yeah, minutes can equal uh, quite a bit of savings. That's fantastic. Well, hey, look, it's it's um it's great to get you on. I think this. This is definitely an interesting one because it, it, it can have massive impact to, uh, to people who are planning, you know, maybe a later stage of their life with wealth. And so glad to get you on and um, let's let's talk about it. Excellent. Ready to go. Yeah. yeah. So that said, uh, this is called the Deferred uh, Sales Trust, right? Correct. Right. So um, I guess at a high level, tell us what it is um, and then let's go through the details. Absolutely. So uh, a deferred sales trust is, is just a way to defer capital gains taxes, kind of like a 1031 exchange, kind of like an IRA, but it, it's uh, it's really spe- specific to highly appreciated assets, such as commercial real estate, such as high-end primary homes, such as cryptocurrency, public or private stock, carried interest, okay, um, GP positions, LP positions, as long as it's a million dollars in net proceeds and, a, and at least a million dollar gain. And it's kind of a little, it's a little known kind of secret in the industry that's been around for about 25 years. I first learned about it at Marcus and Millichap when I was helping people buy and sell investment real estate. And they were tired of the 1031 and overpaying for properties and feeling trapped to, to buy, buy deals. And so it's a way to defer tax, get some freedom and get some options to deploy your wealth when it makes sense for you. Yeah. And I think what I, what drew me is that more or less you, well, we'll, we'll go through this, but when you set it up and and you make it happen, uh, effectively the the sales trust becomes a mechanism for you to um, pay yourself dividends in a way, right? And so, what how how does that structure work at a high level? Yeah, so it's um, great point. It, so it's a it's a way for you to create a um, a trust. Uh, this trust is like a it's actually a business trust, and this trust will pay you over time in a very tax efficient manner. Okay, meaning as you sell multiple assets, you can roll it into one trust and this kind of becomes your cash flow machine. And what's nice about it is the income can be turned on and off um, to to a certain extent, and it can also help you delay some income tax. And so the first thing is just, you know, I I like to say to my um, clients, my strategic partners is defining um, why you would need one and, and really understanding that it's not just about cash flow anymore. It's really about tax flow, right? If, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard about it, this, this conference and other things that are going on, right? Taxes are increasing and the government is on, um, is on the attack for owners, owners of, and who own real estate, who own businesses, and they want the wealth to be moved over to um, uh, mostly to them to, to, to kind of distribute to others, right? And so um, with the Deferred Sales Trust, you're becoming a lender. And this is what's unique about it. You're not an owner. You're actually lending funds to the trust in exchange for a promise of the trust to pay you back. So you're becoming a bank. And instead of taking tax and, and paying it, you're able to defer your tax that you owe to the government and then take cash flow from this trust over time. Ideally, you have a dollar of depreciation for every dollar of cash that's coming out, right? On buying, let's say, a new deal with a new depreciation schedule, which, which can offset with some cost segregation, some cash flow, which is nice. And so we work with clients and our partners all the time to really strategically uh, figure this out. And it's kind of like in a Rubik's cube, right? You got to get all the things to line up. And that might mean moving to a new state. That might mean buying a new deal with new depreciation schedule. That might mean having a loss in a certain year. And then we want to bleed the trust out slowly over time to pay you as we offset tax. Now, we can't do it ideally perfectly every time, but that's a lot of what our clients like about what yeah. we do. So let me let me try to rephrase this, right? So I give you a million dollars, or I, I, I give the trust a million dollars. Um, and then you, with that million dollars or with a team of uh, advisors, go out and buy assets. You know, maybe it's a commercial building, maybe it's um, a business, um, something that has the ability to create income, but also from a tax standpoint, create tax advantages. And that usually comes from depreciation of assets, right? So you think about a building, you have a 27-year uh, depreciation schedule with you know, some techniques that 
make that faster. And let's say you, you make, you know, half, oh, I don't know, $40,000 a year in income. So a 4% return. And let's say you have $40,000 of depreciation that offsets the tax liability of the income, right? Correct. So what you're doing is, is, is to say, okay, let's figure out how to do that. But how does, how does the trust benefit the tax shelter uh, in that scenario? Well, the first thing to understand is um, the uh, is that you can partner with the trust to buy a brand new deal, all tax deferred. So I'm just going to give you a deal story to make this come alive for you. Let's do it. Okay. So in 2006, uh, a gentleman is worth a couple hundred million dollars. This guy hates the stock market. He bought a piece of uh, real estate or he was going to sell a piece of real estate, but he saw there's some writing on the wall. He thought something was going to happen. He thought the marketplace was going to shift. He's looking around for a 1031 exchange property. He can't make any sense of it, right? The cap rates are very low. Inventory is very low and everything's getting bid up. So he had, he really figured he had two options, one pay the tax or two, just, uh, um, um, do a deferred sales trust, right? And so this was new to him. And it was like, he's been used to doing blockbuster his whole life. And he's trying something called Netflix, but he's like, hey, it's better than paying all this tax. So he deferred the tax and he sat into the deferred sales trust. And one of the unique advantages about the deferred sales trust, it doesn't have to be like kind investment real estate, no short, no, no timing restrictions. Okay, you can also put it into stocks, bonds, mutual funds, hard money lending, ground up development. So he put it in a very conservative stock portfolio, okay? Bonds and mutual funds, wasn't subject to lots of, lots of the downturn. And five years later, the bank calls him back up and says, hey, you know that property you sold to that that, 10, that crazy 1031 buyer out of California? He's like, yeah. They like, well, we just foreclosed on it. And we're just curious, do you want to buy it back? And he goes, well, maybe, what's the price? And the guy said, uh, the banker said, uh, about uh, 60 cents on the dollar. And he said, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So he had the trust reallocate the investments into a brand new LLC in partnership with them. And he bought it back at 60 cents on the dollar, all tax deferred. OK, and this is what changed everything for me, because at Marcus and Millichap, when I learned about 1031 exchanges in 2006, we always thought it had to be 45 days, 180. In other words, you had to sell high and buy higher 180 days later. Yep. But in the 08 crash, we figured out that that's blockbuster. And the reason why is because people were overpaying and they knew they were, but they felt trapped. And so when this new thing, Deferred Sales Trust, came in and I understood that you can sell high and buy low, it changed everything for myself and my clients. It helped, helped me grow my business. And it helped, uh, it's helped so many people along the way, let alone that the 1031 doesn't work for cryptocurrency. It doesn't work for businesses. It doesn't work for um, high-end primary homes. We just did an $8.3 million primary home in Palo Alto. So for listeners who are, who are wondering like, hey, if I'm a commercialist, yeah, can I raise some funds with this and different things? So I'll let you, I'll, I'll pause there, see if that makes sense so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was, was going to say, it um, sounds like a, like a studio in Palo Alto. Um, yeah, okay, so, all right. <laughs> yeah, but um. Interesting. So I, right now is probably a good time to do these with basically every asset being substantially inflated, right? I mean, uh, it's it's hard to make sense of 1031s right now if you have bought it for, let's say, 120, you're selling it for 250, and you're trying to have a cash flowing property. Um, so that, it does sound like right now might be the opportune time to consider this this uh, this mechanism to you know begin to shield taxes. Absolutely. Um, There's really three perfect storms. I touched on that, Tom. There's three yeah, perfect yeah, storms going on. And the one most obvious is the economic. I think that in, it, we feel like we're in the eye, eye of the hurricane. You know, last year was a wild year and now things stabilize, but it might be the eye of the hurricane where there's like going to be another wild few years coming up. And so we've seen all time highs in business valuations and commercial real estate and primary homes. And we think it's an opportune time to be a seller. Right. It's pretty clear sellers market. And that's across the nation for just about any asset type. It includes the stock market, too. I mean, these, yeah. these are all time highs. Right. Currency. OK. And even though I mean, those assets. OK. So that's the first storm that's facing us is can you sell high and diversify, get liquidity, pay off your debt and sit on the sidelines? And that's what the deferred sales trust allows you to do. You can literally have the money sitting in the bank waiting for your deal to come. Okay. You don't have to redeploy it any time restriction. The second storm is the demographic storm. And this is known as the largest wealth transfer in the history of the planet. And it's happening with the baby boomers. And every single day there's about 10,000 turning 65 in the U.S. alone. And there's about 77 million in the U.S. alone. And this is known as the largest wealth transfer in the history of the planet. So these are our parents, Tom, right? They're going to be passing our wealth mostly to the millennials in the next 20 years. And they have highly appreciated assets. In fact, the American Bankers Association found that 50% of, of all of the wealth in America is tied to commercial real estate, um, high-end primary homes, and private equity, which is known as like a, like a business. And that's 50% of the total net worth. Well, guess what? That's a lot of toilets, trash, liability, debt. Okay. And they're looking for ways to retire, spend time with their grandkids, travel, start something else that's part of their legacy to give back. Right. 
and they're ready to, and they're kind of tired of a lot of the government regulation, a lot of stuff that's going on. So they're going to sell high. But again, if they don't, if they don't look at the 30 to 50 percent in capital gains tax and depreciation recapture, or have a good plan for it, they either won't sell or they'll sell and get hammered with tax. So into the deferred sales trust to defer that tax to give them options. So that's a demographic demographic uh, graphic storm. The last storm is the political storm. And again, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but they're considering well to uh, take away or limit the 1031 exchange, right? They're, they're increasing the capital gains tax rate. Um, and we're looking at, uh, it looks like the stepped up basis is off the table for right now, but they're at least talking about taking that away. And then you also have the estate tax, which is a big challenge for folks, right? Mm -hmm. And and they're going to they're going to reduce a lot of that exemptions, and that's going to that's going to be subject to forty percent estate tax. So all of these things are the three storms that are facing wealth in America, and the deferred sales trust uh, we believe solves all three of these in a really elegant way, but still gives you the chance to to build wealth on your own terms by buying back into real estate or businesses whenever you want. And that's the best kept secret of the deferred sales trust, right? right? That most people just don't understand. They think it's just letting someone take the money and, and borrowing against it, but you can actually just defer the tax, get it outside your taxable estate, and then buy back when it makes sense for you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, not an exact analogy, but definitely an analogy to some extent. It, it, it reminds me of the 1031 exchange being the traditional IRA and this being the self-directed IRA, right? Uh, it has more flexibility. You can still access assets that you would invest in anyways. Uh, you're just doing it in a way that protects long-term tax um, hits. Love that. That's, I think that's, that's a great analogy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess in terms, you know, it, it's a bit complicated, right? But I, I think it's important as people on this call are probably planners to some degree, if, if I had a large windfall coming to me in the next six months, right? Um, and who knows what that is, stocks, or maybe it's a IPO of a company, or maybe it's a, you know, a, a real estate transaction, what are my steps in talking with you to ensure that I'm protected and set up? Absolutely. So first thing is timing, right? So time is of the essence. So you want to make sure you, you pre-plan your exit plan before you exit. Okay. And this is very important because the IRS, in order for us to do this, we need to do it prior to the buyer removing all contingencies. And at times, even, even we like to do it even before the purchase and sale agreements in place. Um, and that is just uh, a, a term called constructive or actual receipt. And so if, if Tom is selling an apartment complex and the buyer has removed all contingencies and he calls and says, hey, tomorrow we're closing and I'm not doing a 1031 exchange, we'd say, sorry, Tom, it's too late. Had Tom called us two weeks prior to that or a week prior to that. And we had set up the trust um, prior to the buyer removal on contingencies, then we would say, hey, we can help you out. Okay. Now, if it's a 1031 exchange, we can save a failed 1031 exchange as well. We, we've saved, I think, seven 1031 exchanges, mostly out of California in the past uh, three months alone. And so we always want to make sure that you're working with an exchange accommodator that accommodates both a 1031 exchange, a Delaware statutory trust, and a deferred sales trust. And so we have those to work with. So I would say those are the two biggest things to make sure if you're selling commercial real estate. Now, if you're selling everything else, everything else must be set up prior to the buyer moving contingencies or prior to you selling something. Like we just did a $5 million Ethereum Bitcoin case. They bought it for about 100,000. It's worth about 13 million. Part of their vision was to retire from their W-2 Silicon Valley job. They're working 60, 70 hour weeks, which my client was able to do, completely retire. Second, he wants to invest in some investment real estate and, and also some stocks, bonds, mutual funds. And so we set it up prior to him even trading anything. He actually transferred the coin into a brand new exchange account. We use an exchange account called Kraken, and then we sold it to the US dollar. And then that sequence, he received a promissory note. So the key is pre-plan. -pre yep. The neat part is we don't charge anything unless you do the deal. So there's no, there's no obligation either. Yeah, yeah, I think this is, you know, it, it, it all sounds a little bit complex because it, it, it is, which is why there's people like you that help the whole process go smoothly, right? Um, but I think the net of what you're saying is uh, talk to you. If, if you have a big move coming, don't do anything yet. Talk, and, and really, that's what you should do anyways. Talk to your tax advisors, talk to you, talk to you know, anyone in your family, legal, whatever it is, and set up the plan to ensure that you're not paying you know, 25% um, tax rates on, on your gains. It's higher. It's 30 to 50%. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm just trying to average it out. Recapture, right? Yeah. And it's actually going, Biden's actually talking about taking it the federal from 20 to 25 or 28. Yeah. So it could be like 38 to like 58. Yeah. So it's, Crazy. it's big. Yeah, it's, I know it's amazing. Um, okay, great. So there are some stipulations and I know this, this tends to be an instrument for higher net worth people. I don't know if you're thinking about, um, an, you know, a, a, a floor, for maybe someone who's has some, sizable uh, transactions coming, but what, what's the floor for clients uh, in terms of how much money they have to put into the trust? 
Yeah, so we like to we like to hit home runs with the trust, meaning at least a month, one million dollar net proceeds of one million dollar gain. That seems to be pretty much a home run, and because of the fees, and the fees are about one and a half to two percent on a recurring basis, depending on the on the AUM under under management, and about a one time one and a half percent fee up front. Okay, and so we found that if you have about two to three hundred thousand dollars of liability tax that you're actually going to pay, that's where the deferred sales trust really kicks in on the first part of the ROI which is your return on investment for the fees given the tax that you're going to defer. Now, anything less than that, if you have two deals that are $500,000 each, that each combined can hit a million, then I think that can work as well. Um, but anything smaller than that, we typically say just, just pay the pay the tax because your, the fees yeah. are going to eat up the, the difference there. So that's the first part of the ROI. The second one is the income tax deferral. So we have a client, um, he just sold in Palo Alto for $8.3 million. He moved to Nevada, established residency. And the unique part about the trust is you can delay the income. Meaning once you establish residency in Nevada, as the income comes off the trust, you start receiving it in the tax state in which you're in. So he's able to save some stack tax from California to Nevada. Yep. The third one has to do with um, estate tax, right? To move funds outside your taxable estate. So we did a deal in Colorado for our client, it's a $25 million client. They sold a $5 million apartment complex. They had zero basis. Their biggest challenge was all 25 million was inside their taxable estate. And so upon one sale, one deal without giving it all the way to charity, and or having to buy a life insurance or do any, any kind of gifting to their family, they uh, were able to move outside their taxable estate, at which time their kids can inherit estate tax free. Yeah. So it just all depends. We customize our plans for our clients based upon their needs and their total net worth. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I, I do want to hit on one point, kind of sort of a tangent, but very important, I think, is that a lot of investors that I meet are thinking top line, top line, top line, right? Mm -hmm. And when you look at you know tax as an expense, you know it can be a third of your overall uh, you know, uh, bottom line, right? So it's it's equally important to be thinking about top line as it is to be thinking about how to reduce things like taxes, which is why we have you and then my personal CPA on, uh, CPA on next, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. So you need, just, just for clarity, so the net proceeds is not, uh, well, it is, it's, it's the selling price of the asset, right? Minus the debt, minus the commissions, minus the closing right. costs. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, uh, if you have a $2 million prop or property and you have a million dollar liability, your net proceeds, give or take is around a million dollars. That would be a good uh, yep. use case. Okay, cool. Um, what and else? And $1 million gain, right? And so you bought it for a million, you're selling it for 2 million. So it's gotta be enough pain, right? Enough gain yeah. to have enough pain and a liability for us to be, for you to hire us. Yep. So we have a question in, um, it's, it's a good one, but, uh, so basically, Things like opportunity zones or um, other already tax defer, uh, tax deferring, I guess, assets. Um, would you recommend if someone had a deferred sales trust to invest in those, or is there any sort of overlap that kind of disqualifies the benefit? This is a great question, right? Like when to do a 1031 exchange, opportunity zone, Delaware statutory trust, or deferred sales trust. And so um, really think it depends on the merit of the deal, right? So I love 1031 exchanges. You know, I, I own commercial real estate myself. You know, I'm a huge 1031 proponent if and when the deal makes sense. So are you letting the tax tail wag the investment dog or are you buying it on its intrinsic value and the cash flow that it can produce? And if you can find a nice 1031 exchange to go into, then I give you a high five. Again, you don't pay us. Like you're good to go. Like I'm celebrating with you. The challenge is those are very hard to find. Now, the same thing goes for opportunity zones. I love opportunity zones. If the deal makes sense. Now, are you buying it based upon deferring the tax? Or are you buying it because the deal makes sense and the, and the tax deferral mechanism of opportunity zone just is gravy on top of it? Um, same thing with the Delaware Statutory Trust, right? Ten, De Delaware Statutory Trust, by the way, gets confused with the DS Deferred Sales Trust because they're both DSTs. I like to say that's like the Hollywood video to the blockbuster, right? Because it's just another form of a 1031. And so I just believe right now, and I'm in California, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but pr prices have been crazy in California for a couple of years. And I just I didn't have a hard time finding deals that make any sense for these Delaware statutory trusts, for the 1031 exchanges, and for the opportunity zones. That's why the deferred sales trust is amazing because it takes the one thing out that none of them else can do, which is time. We do not have to invest any time tomorrow. We can wait a couple of years. We can sit on the sidelines. We can go into hard money lending. We can do ground up development. We have a client who just sold a $2.6 million deal in Tennessee, and he's building 70 multifamily units, all tax deferred. Um, and he sold in Alabama, he's building in Tennessee, and he's going to get a new depreciation schedule on that. And he's going to be able to offset it. So it's not a one size fits all. I also do some bifractured fractured 1031 exchanges when we have what's called mortgage over basis. And so we did a couple of those last month, where it's a partial Delaware statutory trust and a partial deferred sales trust. So I also want to let you know that it's not necessarily one or the other. Sometimes it's, it's both. Sometimes it's all three. Sometimes it's all four. 
The key is having the right tool for the right vision for your wealth, yeah. right? And then and then figuring out how which one works well and not being stuck. Because guess what? I grew up in commercial real estate and I thought 1031 exchanges was the only real way. Mm-hmm. And then and then I learned about this thing. I thought this is too good to be true. Everyone would be doing it if it was this good. But it took me time to understand and actually see the deals happen. And so we're, yeah. I think we closed seven deals in the past 40 days. We'll close another seven uh, in the next 40. And their deals are, deals are getting bigger and more frequent. And so what I like to say for anyone out there, if you're looking to buy a deal or sell a deal, right, we're in the business of solving problems for ourselves and our partners and other people we're trying to buy from. And you would just want to have the right tool to, side, to solve their actual problem, not tools that necessarily don't work for what they're trying to solve. Yep. And so um, one, all good stuff. And l- let me ask, uh, let's say that there was a business, right, an LLC, S Corp or LLC, uh, and they had, you know, a project. Uh, I'm mostly talking about my, my own company right now. Um, and let's say we were developing some, you know, a, a community of homes, right? And we had a large windfall coming. Is that is this an option where it has to be for an individual, or can an LLC also use this uh, this instrument? Oh, it absolutely works with LLCs, LPs, S corps, C corps, partnerships, separations, right? Uh, part of the challenge with the 1031 is the whole entity typically has to move. And so we have saved failed 1031 exchanges and let the partners go their separate ways. One can pay the tax, one can do the 1031, and the other one can do the deferred sales trust. So every circumstance is a little bit different. We want to see your, your actual structure, but it's very seamless partnership separation. And then the next thing is you can go into your, with 80% of the funds, the next day, you can go into your own active deal your own next development or your own real estate, as long as it's business purpose, right? 80, so if you put 10 million in there, 8 million the next day could be going to your down payment for your next apartment complex sale, right? Yeah, this, not, oh, go ahead. Yeah, this this applies not to like just, just you know real estate development deals um, like I do, but let's say you owned a salon mm-hmm. and you went to sell the salon uh, six months or so or before you sell the salon, talk to you, put it in this trust, sell it, um, and then defer the taxes. Absolutely. And we, we do it all on a simultaneous close, right? So we'll set everything up, but but it won't actually happen just in case someone's wondering, well, do I sell it to this trust and it just hangs out until we find a buyer? No, no, no. We only execute on when the buyer is ready to perform and you exercise the option deck to use the trust. So it's like an assignment of sale. But yeah, it works for salons, cryptocurrency, public or private stock. Yep. Um, it works for um, artwork and collectibles. It works for just about anything that's highly appreciated that's subject to capital gains tax. Yep. Love it. Yeah. Again, this is a powerful instrument. Um yeah, that's that's uh that's that's great stuff. So if you're out there and you and you have a need to defer some taxes, unless you love paying taxes, um, Brett's your guy. So what we'll do, Brett, after, again after this presentation um, today, send out an, an email. Uh, we'll put your contact in, info in there. If anyone is interested, contact Brett. He'll walk you through the process, and um, yeah, they'll go from there. So Brett, as always, it's been great. Thank you, Tom. It's been my pleasure to be here. Yeah. Hey, real quick. So you're a California native. Native. I am. Yeah. I grew up, I grew up in the Bay area, Fremont mission, San Jose and Sacramento, Rockland, Roseville area. Yeah. And so now you're in Manhattan uh, for the anniversary, enjoying food and all that. The most amazing food and uh, central park today and nice. time with some friends over the weekend. And so, and then going to Jim Gaffigan tonight, if you've seen that. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah, great. yeah. So that's great. Yeah. I, I I'm, I'm dying to get back there for some pizza. Um, I haven't had good pizza in so long. So what's the place, which one I've been hearing so this. I've heard, I, yeah. There, you know, I mean, this might get blowback on the chat right now, but I've heard John of Bleakers uh, is uh, it's on, it's in New Haven, I believe, but and then mm-hmm. Sally's is pretty good too. So Sally's. okay, all yeah. right. Let me you know. Should I do one or the other, both. Yeah, there you go. So Brett, it's been great. Mm-hmm. My pleasure. Thanks, Tom, for having me. Yep.